The Celtic mysteries were part of Yeats's effort to establish the state of mind necessary to the attainment of the earthly paradise of the green tree and flowing well. That paradise that is half of the body, an idea which was to form a part of radical innocence. As the rituals themselves state, the candidate is to come to slow, imperishable thoughts. Only through the soul's journey in a boat made out of the bones of the dragon, symbol of matter or the material world. Or as the first stone right says, the region of the shades, i.e. the Neoplatonist material world, must be passed through, for amongst the shades the man sees at last the true significance of the immateriality of matter. The goal of the Celtic mysteries, as in all initiatory rites, was to assist the quester by means of symbols incorporated into rituals to gain power, but a very particular sort of power, quote, self-contained, self-created, self-sufficing, and the seed, the seed of character. That's from Explorations. There's a footnote. This is the same power that enables one to withstand the roof-leveling wind that produces intellectual hatred in lesser souls. If narrow emotion can be driven hence, Yeats wrote in the beautiful poem, A Prayer for My Daughter, the soul recovers radical innocence and learns at last that it is self-delighting, self-appeasing, self-affrighting, and that its own sweet will is heaven's will. The candidate is directed to look boldly into the mirror of his own soul and to confront without trembling the human horrors there. Oh, that reminds me of a certain second-order technique that's never been written down to this day, I believe. For we make a false beauty by a denial of ugliness. Explorations 31. As the variant Cauldron Wright affirms, it is only in the dragon's eye that we can see beyond joy and sorrow. Thus he who would lose the world must first gain it in all its minute particularities. He must follow the four birds which Angus made of him kisses. In the desolation of the world, live out his life. For at the end, my gates are always open. The seeds of the paradox is expressed so well by Crazy Jane's for nothing can be soul or whole that has not been rent um, can be found in the sword right. It's a uh, common idea that Yeats wove into his poetry, uh, the idea of things being broken so they can be passed through, which of course pertains to the Golden Dawn techniques of uh, scrying in the spirit vision traveling as well as the initiatory rites from portal grade and onward. Not to mention the Kabbalistic idea of Tikkun and the shattering of the Sephirotic vessels to form the shells or the klepot, the demons which we must rise up and then reform ourselves from to restore ourselves in as divine beings and humans. So, yeah. The Tikkun. After the candidate has been told the secret of Angus and Etain, sun and moon, consciousness and unconsciousness, he is told to grasp the sword and go on, leaving the eternal pursuit whilst yet pursuing it, for the country where the contraries are equally true. Angus is essential to Etain, who is essential to Angus, as Yin is essential to Yang, but the opposites and contraries exist in homeostasis, not stasis. For that union cannot be, still the pursuit must go on, for life would cease to be life without it. Yeah, he's, this is the, again, the process of energy th seen through the serpent and the rise of Nehushtan, the lightning strike and circulation of light on the tree of life, basically, as well as represented by the Ouroboros. The reconciliation of paganism, which is of the body, and Christianity, which is of the soul. That's an awful duality that I'm glad we don't... I recommend we not keep that Yeats had. <laughs> occurs just here, with the blending of moon and sun and body and soul in the mingling of earth and heaven. Yeats knew that the blissful escapism of his early pastoralism was a fraud, just as the holiest of men is not he who denies the body is in sweet ignorance. But he who must most revels in it. 
accepting it and going beyond it to a vision of the unfallen world. Here there's a footnote for an excellent discussion of Yeats's quest for Eden. See George Mills Hel Harper, um, Yeats's centenary papers. Yeats came to see himself as a new kind of Adam, a poet-priest concerned not with things, but with the essence of things. That's what every uh, second-order adept sees themselves as, because it's part of the initiation. But he who would explore the interior must be as exact as the scientist who explores the exterior. Yeats found himself to be the Adam of, quote, a different, more terrible Eden, for we must name and number the passions and motives of men. There, too, everything must be known, everything understood, everything expressed. There also there is nothing common, nothing unclean. Every motive must be followed through all the obscure mystery of its logic. Mankind must be seen and understood in every possible circumstance, in every conceivable situation, only when we have put ourselves in all the possible positions of life. From the most miserable to those that are so lofty that we can only speak of them in symbols and in mysteries will entire wisdom be possible and that's a, a profound spiritual idea that uh, underlies I'd say most of western mysticism if not world mysticism you must be able to identify with the high and the low reminds me of quote in there's a bit in Romans 12 that references that as well as um, the really basic idea of the path of the chameleon uh, which refers of course to the uh, you know what thus achievement of radical innocence completes the circle of destiny the exile returns not to the place of unorganized innocence from whence he started, but rather to a higher level of innocence. Each going forth returns the quest to radical innocence, and with each return the quester rides the spiral a little closer to heaven. Radical innocence is a term Yeats used to describe a state of being quite different from simple or mere innocence. Yeats agreed with Blake that, oh, there we go, unorganized innocence was an impossibility and that the chief value of life was to transform innocence, which is ignorant, of life into higher or radical innocence unattainable only by means of immersion in and the subsequent transcendence of life's experience. Blake famously characterized this in his uh, innocence, Songs of Innocence and Experience, um, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright in the Forest of the Night, that represented experience and the downfall of innocence. And ultimately, Blake believed we were going to come back to the beginning but in a purified form, that being high innocence uh, of later life or later spiritual development. <clears throat> and with each return, the quester rides the spirit spiral a little closer to heaven. So it's a circle. It's the alchemical cycle, the lesser to greater circulation that is repeated over and over to slowly purify the contents of our alembic from lead into gold. Another footnote here. Yeats's speculations on circular and periodic movement were to bear fruit in a number of ways, chiefly in his theory of drama. Yeats associated furious particularity with the theater of commerce of his day, against which he hoped to place his symbolic drama, with its patterned rather than static and generalized movements. Yeats's dramas were to evoke eternal ancient emotions as contrasted with the momentary emotions of the modern theater. Yeats would have attributed modern theater to the plane of the watery part of the world of waters and that he and Miss Briggs visited in Vision 3 of their Celtic explorations. The airy plane, being the plane of imagination, was the symbolic level of the sort of ritual drama that Yeats himself created. For an excellent discussion of Yeats's views on symbolism of motion, see George Harper Mill's Go Back to Where You Belong, Yeats's Return from Exile, Dublin Dolman Press, 1973. Let's also keep in mind that um, Yeats uh, drew a lot of his understanding of theater from uh, a, the sense of moving, projecting your aura or your energy um, and chanting your lines rather than characterizing them in a mundane day-to-day -day fashion he wanted them to be magically said um almost intoned or chanted and for motion he drew a lot from no, japanese no theater n-o-h no drama 
To express this athletic worldview, Yeats was forced to search for a worthy style. At first, the trappings of Celticism were merely applied to traditional pastoral landscapes, as in Oshin. Actually accepting the implications of an art wedded to rock and hill, i.e. reality, and creating an appropriate style took time. A brief contrast of two plays having something of the same theme will illustrate The Shadowy Waters, 1900, which I actually uh, directed and acted in in um, 1998. That uh, was the first Yeats play I put on. Begun when Yeats was still quite young. Draws heavily on Celtic and Rosicrucian symbolism. I did not actually know that at the time. <laughs> Here's a footnote. Oh, as does his later plays, At the Hawk's Well, 1917. <clears throat> I did 98's plays in three years, from 80, 90, 98 to 2000. Footnote. From uh, among the several variants of this work, of Shadowy Waters, I have elected to discuss the one published in 1900, as it is the version to which Yeats was most likely referring when he wrote Dora... Sigerson, Mrs. Clement Shorter. I am working at my shadowy waters, and it is getting on far better than when I left it aside a couple years ago. Since then, I have worked at Irish mythology and filled a great many pages of notes with a certain arrangement of it for my own purposes. And now I find I have a rich background for whatever I want to do and endless symbols at my hands. I am trying to get into this play a kind of grave ecstasy. It was just about this time, I believe, that Yeats's interest in the Celtic mysteries as rituals began to wane. Instead, he was beginning to see how they could have been incorporated more fully into his art. So this was in 1900, and uh, at the time, of the expulsion of Mathers and Moyne, well, there, and Crowley's silliness, and Yeats would have been 30 years old. So just wrapping up his Saturn return, of course. Both plays have as one of their themes the love quest, but the quest for the first of the first is very different from the quest of the second. In Shadowy Waters, the hero Forgale, a combination of pirate and magician, searches the northern sea where the world dwindles out to find immortal love, a love that the gods give, that he believes will turn the brief longing and deceiving hope and bodily tenderness to the soft fire that shall burn time when times have ebbed away. He is seeking not the love symbolized by the red hound that is seen in vision, desire, life, and joy, but that of the pale hound and deer, symbols taken directly from Oshin, representing not mortal desire, but the immortal desire of the immortals, like that of Angus and Etain. And in res res this respect, Forgale closely resembles the poet of Shelley's Alastor, who rejects earthly desire to pursue the spiritual ideal. When Forgale's ship meets the beautiful Queen Dectora's richly laden craft, a sailor, sea-weary and longing for his beers and skittles, entertains the futile hope that at last Forgale may find his heart's desire on board and turn his galley about and bring me home. But his hope is lost. Forgale seems to know that his quest is destined to end only in death. I follow the grey wings and need no more of life till the white wings of Angus's birds gleam in their apple boughs. Yet even death will be ultimately unsatisfying, as the birds themselves, souls of the dead, make clear. They continue their quest even after death. For Gale hears them say, maybe we shall find our heart's desire now that we are so light. I played the character Abrick. For Gale wins Dectira's love by means of enchantment, but then rejects her repeatedly. She cannot turn him from his quest, even though she offers him the joys of physical love, the peace that awakes into in one another's arms. Forgale tells her in the following improbable stanza that the love of all under the light of the sun is but brief longing and deceiving hope, bodily tenderness, but love is made imperishable fire under the boughs of chrysoberyl and beryl and chrysolite and chrysophrase and ruby and sardonyx. Yeah, it's uh, quite a mouthful. Finally, Dectira realizes that if she is to have him at all, she must needs accept his quest as her own. She says, I will follow you, living or dying. Despite his distaste for mortal love, Forgale is forced to accept that he has fallen in love with the mortal Dectira. 
Nevertheless, in rejecting her once again, he remains loyal to his search for perfect immortal love. The love that seeks valleys and woods and meadows is but a pale reflection of the sort of love Forgale seeks where the world ends. Therefore, De he tells Dectira, I will have none of you. My love shakes out her hair upon the streams where the world ends, or runs from wind to wind and eddy to eddy, masters of our dreams. Why have you cloven me with a mortal love? Pity these weeping eyes. Dectira cuts their boat adrift. The last lines of the play reflect the union that is a scor as scornful of the world as that of the lovers of Axel. Bend lower that I may cover you with my hair, for we will gaze upon this world no longer. If they have accepted any destiny at all, it is only that of certain death. <laughs>